The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. We have a worship service that has many special features this morning. For today is World Communion Sunday, uh, the day that we celebrate and share communion not only in our own small communities, but with our sisters and brothers all across the globe in all the different time zones and places where they are worshiping. So if you have not uh, prepared uh, to celebrate communion this morning, why don't you just hit pause and go grab uh, bread and juice or wine and bring it uh, into your worship space together so that whoever is with you may share share when we do that in our, in our service this morning. Today we're also receiving the Peace and Global Witness offering, and you may give generously by sending uh, a check into the church designated for the Peace and Global Witness, and it will get there where it needs to go. And that, those funds are used for peace initiatives in our community and in the broader Presbyterian denomination and to the ends of the earth. So uh, I do invite you to, to give generously to that. Our worship leadership this morning uh, comes from two of our mission partners. Uh, first, we'll have Sharon Candle, who is the PCUSA Regional Liaison for the Horn of Africa, and Esther Wakeman, who has been a lecturer at McGilvery College of Divinity at Paiyap University in Chiang Mai, Thailand. They will be sharing, uh, each one will have a message for us this morning. Our choral scholars from the College of Worcester will be sharing their gifts with us uh, in the musical offering. And the liturgy today comes from the resource Peace and Global Witness, Worship for the World, and comes to us in video clips that sisters and brothers across the globe have taped, uh, some in their own language and some in English. The flowers that you will see later on in the service are dedicated to brothers and sisters, the family of Christ around the globe. And now, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. Our service music today comes from three 20th century masters. First of all, Louis Vierne, a communion setting of his. I have my, one of my teachers to thank for this. Eileen Gunther in Washington, DC, introduced me to this music just before Anne and I got married, and we actually incorporated it into our wedding service. It's a beautiful setting uh, designed to be played while the congregation is partaking of communion. The postlude today is by the Belgian composer Flor Peters. Uh, he was a pedagogue in addition to being a recitalist, and this is his festival voluntary. Our musical offering today comes once again from our choral scholars. It's a setting of the 14th century Latin text, Ave Verum Corpus, or Hail True Body. The text, which is attributed to Pope Innocent IV, reminds us of the sacrifice of Christ for our sins and also suggests that our communion together may be a foretaste of what awaits us in the great banquet in heaven. Thank you.
Nos reunimos desde el occidente y hasta el oriente, desde el sur y hasta el norte, para celebrar al Dios de paz que nos acompaña en nuestras acciones de paz. Este Dios de paz nos acompaña en todas las circunstancias que nos rodean. Le alabamos. Amén. Let us pray. Mwari wedu, musiki wedu, nyadenga wedu. Bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships. Bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and the exploitation of people. Bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war. Bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Աստծո փարության դիմաց կջանշնանք մեր թերությունները։ Աստծո ողորմած լալուն դիմաց կհամարցակին ճշմարտությունը խոստովանիլ մեր անցերուն մասին եւ մեր աբրած աշխարհի նկատմամբ։ Որբես աստծո զավակները եկեք խոստովանինք մեր հանցանքները։ Լինուսալլի Ռաբբանա ու իլահն ռահում Խալիկուլ կաուն ու մա ֆի لقد وهبتنا بسخاء عالما غنيا ومتنوعا ولكننا ما زلنا نصر على العيش بانانيه وطمع نعترف اننا شوهنا الخليقة وسممنا بيئتنا بممارستنا الاستهلاكيه ولمصالحنا الشخصيه انت جعلتنا اخوه واخوات بالمسيح واردتنا ان نكون واحدا لكننا بنينا الجدران 
وفصلنا بيننا وبين قريبنا الإنسان لقد أعطيتنا الحكمة وموهبة الإبداع ولكننا استخدمناها للتحايل على الآخرين وتطوير أسلحة للدمار والموت أعطيتنا الشريعة لتنظيم حياتنا ومجتمعاتنا ولكننا سخرناها للانتقام من أعدائنا واخترنا الحرب بدل السلام لقد تجاهلنا الفقير والضعيف وكرمنا الغني والقوي ولم نتصرف بحسب مشيئتك اغفر لنا يا رب لأننا نجرؤ على التباهي بإنجازاتنا البشرية غير معترفين بأنك أنت وحدك تستحق التسبيح فانظر إلينا برأفتك وامحو آثامنا Աստված մեզ ընդունած է Հիսուս Քրիստոսի վրա մեր ունեցած հավատքին վկայությունով, որուն միջոցավ մեղկերու թողություն ստացանք։ Թողան ոգնեմ ես, որ ամմեն ադեն անոր խաղաղությունը սպրենք մեր շրջանագին ու աշխարին։ Ամեն։Placing open hand palm together before you at chest high and say, Kopraja Uyphon. Kopraja Uyphon. Kopraja Uyphon. Hello. If I had all the money in the world, I would travel. I love to see how other people live and the culture and the places that they visit and the foods that they eat and what their surroundings and their communities look like. It's so interesting to get to know somebody that is different than you. And I have this thing here called a globe. This is a fun blow up one that we can play with. But on this globe are all the countries and continents in our world. And so I could spin this around and point my finger the Atlantic Ocean. But if we went over here a little bit, we'd be in Brazil. And the great thing about today is the people that are in Brazil today, the Christian community there, are practicing communion. Today is World Communion. So Christians all around this colorful, beautiful world are celebrating communion. And if you listen to the word communion, you might think it sounds like community. And I think that's a great way to think about when we take communion, we are in a wonderful community of Christ. So not just in our little town, not just in our own church, not in our own state, or even in our own country, but people all around the world are taking communion today to be in community with Christ. And when we are in community with Christ, we can have a peaceful mindset. We can share that love to other people. And we know that when we get to visit, oh boy, the Pacific Ocean, but close to, let's go over here to Australia, then we know that Christians in Australia are practicing communion too. And so I think that's a wonderful thing to think about. And so I hope today you'll find a globe or a map or you'll look on the internet and find a different country and learn about people in that country and know that today Christians in that country we're taking communion with us to be in the community of Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making people all over the world and bringing us together today and every day to be in community with you and to share in communion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time in our worship, we have the great joy of hearing from two of our mission partners, uh, Sharon Candle, who is the PCUSA liaison for the Horn of Africa, that is Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan, 
And then following her, we will hear from Esther Wakeman, who comes to us from Chiang Mai, Thailand, where she is a guest lecturer at Payap University. So let us prepare our hearts to receive their message. Greetings to you from Millersburg, Ohio. I'm Sharon Candle. I am the regional liaison for the Horn of Africa. That's Sudan, Ethiopia, and South Sudan. Now, some of you may have um, known that my husband and I were doing this job together, but as of September 17th of this year, he has retired, and so I get the full responsibility of the job, and I'm actually looking forward to it. As you know, Peace USA has a travel ban on for all work-related travel, and so we've not been able to return to South Sudan. We'll continue to live here in Millersburg until we're allowed to, to return. Um, it's not too much of a hardship since um, this is where our family lives, our children and our grandchildren, so it's a good place to be, uh, except for the cold winters, but we'll manage somehow. Um, I would love to take this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the Horn of Africa, the things that are going on there, especially since this is going to be um, on International Peace Sunday. I thought it would be really good to just kind of update you on these three countries that are all suffering from some kind of political unrest and are see desperately wanting peace in their countries. Sudan um, has been a Muslim country and um, as of about two years ago well, there was a coup and the Prime Minister was overthrown and while it is still a Muslim country it is much more open to Christian organizations being in the country. This has brought about um, a certain kind of peace, I guess you would say. At least there is not the outward oppression of the Christian church in Sudan. Um, in the past, they've been known to have uh, had Christian churches bulldozed down, even on a Sunday morning. Um, Christians were not allowed to uh, carry, they could be put in prison just for carrying a Bible, so those kinds of things. And so that has changed as of two years ago. Things are much more open, they're much more uh, agreeable to having Christian organizations come in. Matter of fact, I met with the Minister of Religious Affairs for Sudan, and I've met with him twice, and both times he was very adamant, you really need to bring more of your people into Sudan. We really need help in rebuilding Sudan. We need help with, um, with education, so with rebuilding schools, clinics, and hospitals, and reconciliation. Um, and not just the Presbyterian Church, but all, pre all Christian organizations, um, there was an understanding on his part that, that it would only be through allowing these Christian organizations back into the country and to do the work that they want to do, would there be any kind of chance for peace in, in Sudan, um, some kind of reconciliation between the Muslim and the Christian. There's got to be a way to to bring uh, uh, about an understanding of we we can believe differently but live side by side and and that is his ultimate goal um he's not wanting to do and he is a muslim so he he you know wants to be able to practice being uh being a muslim but he also understands that the christians need to be able to um practice their religion openly uh, and things have changed. They are Christmas is now a a holiday, and people don't have to go to work on on Christmas. On on Sunday mornings, um, you cannot employers cannot demand a Christian to come to work before noon on a Sunday so that they have an opportunity to go to church. So and there's a possibility of even some um, church property that was taken being returned. So, so there have been some big, big changes in Sudan. They've still got a long ways to go. There, there's still unrest. There's still um, some Muslims who are fighting very strong for it to, to go back to how it had been, to being a very strong Muslim country and for Christianity to be completely pushed out of the country. But there is some progress on, on it being a more open country and uh, I haven't tested it as to see whether we could actually have a mission coworker living in South, in Sudan. It's it's not a, a possibility at this point in time, but um, according to the Minister of Religious Affairs, uh, he would even happily help get the visas and work permits and things like that 
So th there's a little bit of hope there that things are changing. Um, but there is still political unrest in the country. There is still flooding in the country and, of course, COVID-19 like everywhere else. Um, and all of these things together are making it so that th there's still a, a, a tenseness um, between the Muslims and, and the Christians or Muslims and anybody else in the, in the country. So there's still a lot of prayer needed. There's still a lot of reconciliation needed. There's um, an education education as to what does it mean to be able to to allow um, Christians in the country and to be operating openly and freely does you know Muslims need to be educated that um, it's not meant as a direct threat to them that they're still free to to worship how they want to worship so there's a lot of work to be done there. And there's still a lot of distrust um, with the government. Uh, it's a transitional government, and it's one that, you know, it, transitional governments are very hard and difficult. Uh, they, they can't always do the, what needs to be done. They're fighting the old guard and trying to bring in the new guard and keeping both happy. Um, so the, there's a lot of political unrest, um, quite, quite a ways to go. So we're, we're, we continue to pray for, for, the, for the leaders of that country that they will continue to put uh, the, the people of the country first uh, and, and to allow the people to, to worship however they would like to worship. Now, they are worshiping more openly and for, for that we are giving a lot of thanks. And we are giving thanks for the church that is there, the Presbyterian church that is there, that they are a, a, a long-standing church, a long history there, um, strong, strong Christians who have, have withstood an awful lot and are looking forward to this more open time to be able to evangelize, um, do more, even just discipleship training within, within themselves. Um, they've been kind of underground or been kept from having large gatherings and things so that it's been difficult to build the church and so they're looking forward to this opportunity to to be able to build the church to do discipleship training to do evangelism to um, just take care of each other uh, it's been hard even for for christian to care for christian in this in this very oppressive community country that they were living in so while there's not peace, there is not direct war anymore. Um, so th that's a cause for celebration and, and thankfulness. Now, Ethiopia, also another <laughs> country that has um, got a lot of political unrest going on in it, um, and it's, it's ethnic-related. Um, you know, in, in countries, it's hard for us sometimes to understand here in the United States that in many of these countries, there are so many different ethnic groups and the, the larger ethnic group, of course, has all the power because they've got all the people to vote for them. And if for some reason, one of the dominating ethnic groups gets put out, um, there's going to be unrest. And that's kind of what's happening in, in Ethiopia. There's political, ethnic unrest in, in the country. And while the prime minister has made great strides, I mean, there's now um, peace between Ethiopia and Eritrea, airplanes going back and forth, which they hadn't done for 20 years. Um, I, there's been a lot of progress but there is still a long, long way to go. And when, in a country like Ethiopia, when they have political unrest, it affects things like um, internet can be shut down. I was there, it was shut down for two weeks. Um, so internet can be shut down, cell service can be iffy, um, traveling by road, also very iffy. Um, so it, it just makes it, uh, it's, it's difficult then. 
Because when you're having that kind of difficulty with travel, even back and forth, then how do you get goods back and forth, even within the country, much less from outside the country coming in? So prices go up. And this is true in, in all three of the countries. Prices go up on basic goods, foods, you know, rice, beans, those kinds of things. And unless you're growing it yourself, you might be paying quite a bit for it. So there, there is a fair amount of political unrest. Now, I would say that in the areas where there is more political unrest in Ethiopia than in other areas where it's really bad, um, we do have a very strong Presbyterian church community. And that church is, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're doing what they can to speak out for peace in their community. They're, they're trying to, to broker peace where they can, and they're trying to bring reconciliation among groups of people <clears throat> that maybe don't really want reconciliation, but they're trying to convince them of it. So there's, there's, there's hope. I mean, I, yeah, there's hope. There, there, there's hope in, in, in Ethiopia that, that um, this prime minister can, can bring things under control and can, and can bring some kind of uh, peace back into the country. Um, you know, it's really disruptive when, when uh, your internet is shut down for a couple of weeks. You know, for me, it's, it's frustrating because I can't get a hold of my partner, but then I have to think, but from the partner's perspective, if you're living, you know, out in nowhere land, you know, Ethiopia, and your only way of communication is internet, and then it's shut down, and you can't even let people know that you're there, that you're alive, or that you need help, or, you know, I mean, that that has to be, I, I, I just, I don't know how you, how you deal with that. Oftentimes, they'll, they'll, they'll go over roads that aren't necessarily safe to travel on to get to a place where they can get internet for a little bit to let me know that they're okay that they're trying to get me a request or a report or an update or something and i'm like oh my goodness the least of you know your worries right now is getting a financial report to me you need to be staying safe and doing what you need to do in your community so you know and then you throw COVID 19 onto it where you're supposed to have social distancing, but you're in a community, in a country where that's unheard of. You don't social distance. You you live together. You you do everything together. Everything is in partnership, and space between people is an unheard of thing. So you throw that into the works, and it um, it's 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 adding to the stress levels, and I think it's helping to to escalate. Um, an already bad situation into a worse situation. So prayers for South, uh, for sorry, for Ethiopia are definitely needed. But I, along with those prayers, just for peace, but also prayers just for the leaders of the church there, that they, that they, um, that God gives them the wisdom they need in in knowing how to go forward and how to, to reach out to the warring communities and stuff and help them to find a way to live together in peace. Uh, then there's South Sudan, precious South Sudan, youngest country in the world, and with, oh, so many problems going on. Again, prayers for the leaders of this country that, uh, that they would put the needs of the people before their own needs. Um, some of the stories that we've heard are just horrible of how much money the, uh, leading people have taken, you know, the president and the others. Um, I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars that um, I think it was the UN just put out a report that they said have been um, misappropriated. So you have that going on. You have ethnic warfare that's been, or ethnic fighting that has been going on for well, since before I was born, um, my parents were missionaries there, and I've been reading through the, their letters. And when I read about the unrest that was there then, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, it sounds just like today. 
And how do you how do you how do you find a way to forgive something that's been going on for centuries? Well, I don't know about centuries, but for a long, long time. I know that there has been unrest in that country for over 50 years. And I mean serious unrest. That how how do you how do you get past that? How do you work past it? Especially when you consider that out of that 50 years, there was only about a 10 year period of supposed peace where people could even get an education. So that tells you that, you know, those that are educated are, you know, 50 or older. And the young ones coming up aren't getting the education they need unless they've been out of the country. Um, and if they've been out of the country, that probably means they were in a refugee camp and being educated outside of the country. So their um, view of their own country is, is um, colored a little bit by just simply having grown up outside of the country and being educated outside of the country. So South Sudan has tremendous problems going on in it. Um, the thing is, is there's so much potential for South Sudan. Um, they, one of the claims that I've heard, I don't know if this is true, but it's a claim that I have heard, is that South Sudan's land in, in this one area is fertile enough, and it's a large enough area, that it could probably feed most of Africa. But it's not happening because there's no security for people to be able to get in and, and do any farming and the, the kind of farming they're talking about would be more commercial kind of farming and, and that's just not going to happen right now. So there is so much potential for South Sudan to be self-sufficient if nothing else and because of the leadership of the country that's just simply not happening. Now on a bright note the South Sudan Council of Churches which um, is made up of seven different um, denominations, two of which are Presbyterian, um, is taking a very large stand and they are, t they are pushing peace on, on the uh, leaders of the country. They actually are able to meet with the president, the vice president, there's five, five vice presidents, meet with all the different vice presidents and so they're 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 taking an active role in trying to bring peace into the country they created an action plan for peace that was broadcast out throughout the whole country that all the denominations were promoting everywhere in trying to help bring peace into the country they actually have a hotline now for um, victims and perpetrators and there has even been some success in that where they have had a perpetrator and and his victim meet together and you know one to forgive the other and to try to figure out okay how do we go forward from here so there so there are things there are really some good things happening it's just for it to really take hold in south sudan it's going to mean the the, the government getting behind it and supporting that kind of uh, movement within the country but there is hope and the one thing that these three countries all have in common is hope they all have hope for peace in their countries in their lifetime one thing that Africans have over us is that um, they have hope that it'll happen in their lifetime but it doesn't they have hope that it'll happen in their children's lifetimes and that's good enough for them where oftentimes we in the West, if, if we can't have it today, you know, or tomorrow, why bother, kind of. Um, I'm, you know, that's a very general, broad statement, but um, they are very patient and they will lay the first tiny stones in a new path now in the hope and the prayer that they're grandchildren or great-grandchildren will reap the benefit from the peace process that is being started now. So that's kind of a rough overview, very, very broad stroke overview of Sudan, Ethiopia, and South Sudan, all three countries, um, political unrest, all three of them having major flooding, 
of course, COVID is there. Um, but within the church community, there is hope in each one of those countries for, for peace, for a peaceful p future at some point in time. And they're doing whatever they need to do to make that happen. I just wanted to also bring you up to date a little bit on the, our mission workers are still working, even though they're here in the United States. All of the coworkers are finding ways to, to continue to do their work from the United States, whether it be teaching or organizing things or just staying in communication with the leaders of the churches um, where they serve. Everybody is working full time and um, maybe even working a little harder because it's just simply harder to work from here. But they are all working. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the prayers that you offer up on behalf of the mission coworkers, but also of the countries that we work in. It means everything to us to know that you're praying for us and our partners. And I want you to know that the partners in each one of those countries, they're praying for you. They're praying for you in the pew. They're praying for your church. They're praying for Peace USA as a whole, and they are praying for the United States. And I hear this from them in almost every email, every phone conversation, every Zoom call that I have. They want you to know that they are praying for you. So thank you for your prayers for them. Thank you for your prayers for, for me personally, for the coworkers, and thank you for the financial support that you give us. And thank you for this time to share with you. Greetings from Chiang Mai, Thailand. The world is weary on this World Communion Sunday, 2020. I'm weary, and maybe you are too. COVID-19, economic pain, political conflict, both here in Thailand and in the US, both countries that I care about very much. Churches in distress, the Presbyterian Church USA and the Church of Christ in Thailand, our partner church here. Higher education challenges. Payup University is experiencing the most challenging time of its 45-year existence. Climate change, fires and floods. And personally, I have about eight friends and family battling cancer at the moment. I'm weary. Jesus invites us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. When I look at the messes that fill this world and fill my life, and when I admit the mess in my heart, the burden can feel huge and oppressive. I feel weary. And Jesus says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Today we are invited with Jesus, friends and followers all over the world to come and eat at his table to come to Jesus and receive his love, forgiveness, receive his life, and receive hope. Recently, one of my students shared his struggle to overcome some habits that he knows are not good. And he asked what he could do. So I invited him to think about how Jesus dealt with temptation. Remember what happened just before Jesus was tempted in the desert? Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit came on him and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I delight. The community of the Trinity reminded Jesus who he was and filled his heart with the joy of being loved and delighted in. 
In the strength of that reminder, Jesus was able to remain himself and stay true to his mission. The tempter challenged him to question his identity. Remember, he said, if you are the son of God, do this or do that. As if maybe he wasn't the son of God to sow that seed of doubt. But Jesus remained secure in his identity and that love fueled his life in the desert. Come to me. Come and receive my love and affection. I'm giving my life for you so you can be forgiven and free. Take my yoke. Come and work with me. You aren't alone. I've got work for us to do together. I'm gentle and humble. The responsibilities I give you will fit you well. This whole mess of a world is not yours to bear. It's mine and I've got it. And I have a part for you to work on with me. I put my power and strength to work in you and through you in the yoke that we share. I love working with you. Come to me. My friends, I think that we contribute to the mess in the world when we forget who we are. We are God's beloved, as is every person on this planet. As we come to Jesus, as we get to know him and experience his gentle and humble heart, and as we work with him, we become more like him. Let's come to Jesus and share this meal that he has prepared for us with his life. On this World Communion Sunday, we, like our brothers and sisters across the globe, 
have been invited to this table, a table set for us, a table full of joy, full of challenge, full of sustenance. So come, you are welcome here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It is a right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, gracious God, author of heaven and earth. You spoke into being a world filled with diversity and blessed by your breath of life. Rainbow colors bloom in spring, summer breezes bring garden delight, and now as autumn comes our way, we see the work of your paintbrush upon every face and tree. In mercy, while we were still held to the chains of our winter, of pride, self-righteousness, and historic egos, you loved us steadfastly and delivered us to reflect the beauty and diversity of your grace, to bring us into a community of love and hope and peace. And so with all your people on earth and in every place where two or more are gathered in your name, and all the company of heaven who have gone before us, we praise your name. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, our brother, Jesus Christ. He came into the world at a particular time and in a particular place, but he shared news that is good and joyful for people in all times and in all places, the good news about your peaceable kingdom. He broke down barriers that kept people from knowing and loving each other. He reached out to those who were cast out of society and proclaimed through his very life the extent of newness as it is being revealed over all the earth. We remember Jesus. We remember his earnest prayer that we should all be one, united in love. We remember his promise to be with us always. And we remember that through the power of his witness, we are always being formed anew into his body with Christians around the world. And so in remembrance of your working in and through Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon this bread and this cup so that as we share them, we may experience the grace of Christ grace to make us his body here in this community of faith and with others throughout the world, united in love, mission, and ministry until that glorious day when all barriers will be broken and your love will reign in every heart. To this end, we join our voices with those around your world who are pray praying the ancient prayer we have been taught, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We remember that on the night of his arrest, gathered in an upper room with friends, disciples, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you.
the same way he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in me, poured out for you. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim God's saving grace to the end of time. At this time, I invite you to pass around your own elements from wherever you are. And we remember that these are the gifts of God for the whole people of God and today around the whole world. And so we say, thanks be to God. the bread of hope and the cup of healing and wholeness. Let us pray. Gracious God, Your bread and your cup have symbolically united us with brothers and sisters all around the world. We pray that we might sense that oneness, that we might work for it here where we are and nurture it whenever we can. We thank you for these gifts of grace. May they sustain us and empower us for all that you would have us do. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now and forevermore. Amen.